I'm very happy to spend a little bit more time with you and have another discussion about endodontic diagnosis. And this time, the emphasis will be on vital pulp testing. In a previous episode, we looked at endodontic diagnosis from the perspective of gathering the clinical findings, but today we'll look at how to determine the status of any given pulp within any given tooth. Now obviously when we talk about the three phases of the endodontic examination, vital pulp testing, we have no agreement regarding exactly how to do these tests, what are the best methods as an example to deliver a cold stimulus to a tooth. So I'm just going to simply share with you what I do. There are other ways to do things, and this isn't the only way to do things, but it's a way that works in a very predictable method, especially if you get used to vital pulp testing every single patient that comes into your office. And I'll explain a little bit more about that in just a moment. Let's get started with vital pulp testing. I guess the most important thing to say in vital pulp testing, there are four methods. There is the cold stimulus or the cold test. There's the hot test. There's the electric pulp test, which is affectionately referred to as the EPT. And then there is the cavity test. Today, we will only speak about what patients actually do. And what they actually do is they drink cold liquids and hot liquids. And so they're reporting hot and cold sensitivity from time to time. And when they do, we need to reproduce their chief complaint. So if a patient complains of cold, I'm running a cold test. If a patient complains of sensitivity to heat, I'm running a hot test. If the patient has having no thermal sensitivity, hot or cold, then because of the ease of performing the test, I do the cold test. I'm not using the electric pulp test, and I will not be speaking today about the cavity test because it's done so infrequently that over about 35 years of practice, I think I've used that test two times. So it really doesn't justify your time or my time describing when, why, and how to do the cavity test. So let's look at how to do hot and cold pulp testing. Well, first of all, as a teacher, I can tell you that most people don't do these tests. And again, I'll be redundant. If they do them, they do them on patients that are complaining of symptoms. But they're not just doing vital pulp tests on asymptomatic teeth. And I believe they should. In fact, I'll say it more specifically. Before you ever pick up your handpiece and touch any tooth, you should know the status of that pulp so that you're not working on a tooth that's irreversibly involved, yet asymptomatic. So to get a good baseline, to be confident that your subsequent tests are reliable, you need to first get the patient's uh, familiarity with how the test works on contralateral teeth, opposing teeth, and finally, adjacent to the tooth that you suspicion as the endodontic culprit. And by getting a baseline, we're not comparing Sam to Jim. We're not comparing Mary to Martha. We're comparing that patient's teeth to that patient's teeth. So it is a fair apples to apples comparison. What I like to do is when I'm out of the office, my assistants will purge anesthetic out of a carpule. And once the carpule's empty, they'll cut some floss so that it's about one inch or two and a half centimeters longer than the entire length of the carpule. They will then fill up about eight or 10 of these carpules with water, and they'll put these carpules in a cup and put the cup in a freezer of your refrigerator, the freezer compartment. And the reason the cup is used is so that the carpules don't inadvertently fall over and drain out the water before it freezes. This way, when you need to have ice, you can simply pull out the floss and remove a pencil of ice. And you can take that ice and put it in a two by two gauze so that your fingers don't prematurely warm it. Again, don't go to the tooth in question, go to an opposing tooth or a contralateral tooth and let's use hand signals. In fact, how the hand signals would work is when the patient first feels cold in their tooth, have them raise their hand. You come off the tooth, remove the stimulus, have them keep their hand up as long as the sensation lingers in their tooth. And 
as you begin to notice from doing various teeth, you're looking for the immediacy of the response, the intensity of the response, and the duration of the response. And out of those three, the duration is diagnostic. You're looking for that pulp that feels the sensation to cold much, much longer than the contralateral opposing or adjacent teeth in the same patient's mouth. So the cold test can be done on the lingual surface or the buccal surface, but I prefer to be done cervically because that's the closest distance into the pulp. And if you begin to pulp test all your patients, maybe not the first visit, maybe not the second visit, but sometime during the early matriculation of that patient into your office, you need to know what the status of the pulps are and these results need to be recorded because any shift from that recording is diagnostic and could allow you to intervene and intercept a pulp that is on its way towards gangrene necrosis. Now I would like to talk to you about the HOT test. The HOT test can be done in a variety of different ways, but the simplest way is to use a HOT pulp test tip. And a HOT pulp test tip can go into a variety of different units, such as the calamus unit, and we can take a little bullet of gutta percha and we can thermal soften it around the tip of the instrument. And that thermal softened ball of gutta percha then can be placed on a moist tooth. And again, you're looking for the immediacy of the response, the intensity of the response, and the duration. Again, as dentists doing diagnostics, we don't put so much emphasis on the immediacy of the response. It just may mean that they feel immediately that it's an inflamed tooth. Maybe you did a, rest a restoration uh, a few days ago. If they have an intense response, it could be that there's exposed uh, dentin or cementum. And again, if you had done a recent restoration, they may say it is a significant response to cold. But how long does it linger? You're looking for that pulp where the sensations subjectively linger inordinately as compared to contralateral, opposing, or adjacent teeth. So we put the test together. The little warm thermal softened ball of gutta perches on the end of the metal probe. Never put a metal probe directly on a tooth because you can get a lot of crazing in the enamel and you'll get too much conductivity in a metal restorative as an example. So just use the ball of thermal softened gutta percha. Because it's thermal softened, it'll take the morphological shape of the tooth you're placing it on and you'll get a better adaptation and better conductivity through the tooth into the pulp proper. Again, the hand signals, raise your hand when you first feel the sensation of heat in your tooth. Keep your hand up as long as the sensation lingers and then instruct your patient to lower their hand when the sensation abates and goes away. You'll notice that you need to do this baseline because you don't want to fool the patient and you don't want the patient to fool you. So you can move over to another tooth and watch for the hand signals and get those down with the patient so that they're very rhythmic and very uh, believable. And if we go back down to that mandibular incisor that was discolored, that's a necrotic pulp. So oftentimes a necrotic pulp uh, is going to give you an exaggerated response and be ready to follow that up with anesthesia. Let me explain another important way to perform the hot test. The method I have just explained is very useful and works frequently. But there are some instances where you will perform that test very carefully and you will not reproduce the patient's chief complaint. In these instances, you're probably not getting enough heat bathing the tooth circumferentially to adequately provoke the pulp into a response. In these instances, we need to isolate the tooth with a rubber dam without anesthesia. And so we have to carefully release the clamp on the tooth, being careful not to pinch the free gingival margin. Patients will let you do this, and with a little bit of patience and some skill, you can isolate many, many teeth with a rubber dam without anesthesia. Now, we most all of us have hot coffee water in our office, so we can draw up some of that hot water into a handheld syringe. 
And what we can then do is flood that water over the tooth so that that water is bathing the tooth in its entire circumferential dimensions. This will give you much greater conductivity into the tooth. When you provoke this response, have your assistant trained and able and ready and prepared to flush the tooth with cool water out of your triplex syringe so you can turn off the pain. And then you can take off the dam and explain to the patient what this test means and what lies ahead and what you intend to do uh, if it's endodontics or remove the tooth. So this is an effective way to do the hot test when the former way that I explained using the heat transfer devices do not work. Well, I've just reviewed with you how to do vital pulp testing using the cold and hot methods. As you begin to pulp test the various teeth within the patients that visit you daily, you will begin to start to uncover a lot of endodontically irreversibly involved pulps. Probably most importantly, you're going to start having more confidence because as you perform the test routinely on all patients, whether it's the first visit or the fourth visit, you are doing this over and over and through repetition, excellence shows up and you'll begin to have quite a bit of confidence how to perform this test and what it means if they don't feel it. As an example, if a patient doesn't feel the cold test, it may mean that the pulp has receded below the crest of bone. And in calcific cases, oftentimes there's not enough pulp tissue in the chamber to elicit a response. Alternatively, the patient may have a necrotic pulp. Dead tissue doesn't feel cold. And as a third option for why they may not feel cold is they may have had a previous root canal. So hopefully you've learned a little bit more about vital pulp testing, but the most important thing to leave you with is start pulp testing each patient, each time, every time, all the time, and your confidence will get to be a lot greater. And when you remove doubt, confidence shows up.